the goal for all agents is to have your business be 90% referral based. It's exactly the same for recruiting. It's just, you gotta have your change in your mindset with, as a broker. Hello, welcome to episode 194 of the Smart Agents Podcast. As always, my name is Michael Walter and I'll be your host. On today's episode, we are joined by Jim Remley, founder of eRealestate Estate Coach. Launching his own real estate career 35 years ago at the age of 19, he quickly found success in his Oregon market and ranked in the top 1% of agents nationwide. By the age of 24, he launched his own real estate company and grew that to include 17 offices. Over the course of our conversation, Jim shares his insights on building a successful real estate brokerage. He emphasizes on the importance of recruiting and retaining top agents, sharing his tips for creating a positive company culture to ensure your agents sing your praises. Jim also touches on the essential technologies that every modern real estate brokerage should implement. But before we get on to the day's featured interview, the Smart Agents Magazine is available and full of insights and strategies designed to help real estate agents grow their businesses. Inside, you'll find interviews and advice from leading real estate professionals, marketing tips to flood your business with leads, and even swipe and deploy files full of practical tools to enhance your business. Be sure to click the link in the episode description to claim a free digital issue. Also, if you enjoy this conversation, be sure to like and subscribe. The Smart Agents Podcast streams on all major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and YouTube. And finally, if you or someone on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. We're always on the lookout for new stories to share. All right, let's get on to the day's featured interview with Jim Remley. Be sure to check out his website, eRealEstateCoach.com. I've included a link in the episode description. All right, well, really the way I like to start everything out is if you could, uh, you know, just introduce yourself to us a little bit, who you are and where you're at in the country. Sure. My name is uh, Jim Remley. Uh, I am out in Southern Oregon, beautiful Southern Oregon here. Uh, so we I'm just over the border from California in Medford and Ashland, Oregon. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about uh, your real estate career. I know you've been in the real estate industry uh, for quite a while and built up uh, several businesses uh, within the industry. Yeah, I've been in the business for, it's going on 35 years this year. So it's been a long time. I started when I was 19, college dropout, worked at a lumber mill before I got my real estate license. Um, had pretty early success. I opened my first company at 23, grew that to 17 offices uh, largest in Oregon at one point, uh, independent company. And then I sold that in 06. I worked for NAR for 10 years, teaching all the designation programs, including the ABR designation. And then I helped another buddy of mine grow a company in Southern Oregon, which I became an owner in. And we grew that from about 30 agents to 250 agents in three offices. Um, and we got ranked in the Real Trends Top 500. So tiny little population base of 80,000, closing 3,000 transactions a year, doing about $1.4 billion in sales. Wow. So tell me, you know, going all the way back uh, at 19 years old, what was it about the real estate industry that, you know, attracted you? Uh, probably just opportunity for me. It was, uh, I, I had tried to go to college, uh, didn't work out for me. And I look, was looking for, you know, I definitely entrepreneurial. My first business was as a window cleaner. <laughs> I opened <laughs> when I was 15. So I had wind clear window cleaning. Uh, so I've very, always been an entrepreneurial guy. And I, it was just a great outlet for me. I, to be honest with you, when I first started, I, I was amazed at the fact that, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of sellers in that market would basically give every realtor, you know, X percentage of the equity of their home if they could sell it. And I, you suddenly, it's different than any other industry where you're having to buy inventory yourself and put it on your shelves and hope that it sells and it's not perishable. Or if you own a restaurant, you buy this stuff and then it sits there and rots and you got to throw it out. That's not true with real estate. You have all this inventory you can sell and you don't own it. And if you don't sell it, it doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't affect you that much. Um, but if you do sell it, you make a bunch of money. So I was like, this is the greatest business ever. So that's why I got excited about it. When you, and when you did get started, um, how did you, how did you grow your business and your name and, you know, kind of get your foothold in the market? So for me as 19 year old, none of my friends were buying houses, right? They're just like <laughs> keggers or something. Um, from, so for me, I had basically my sphere of influence was you know, a small family group and the people that, you know, were in my circle, but most of them are not buying houses. So I had to quickly figure out how do I grow my audiences quickly? And so for me, that was for sale by owners, expired listings and, and doing mailings. Uh, I was uh, huge into absentee owner mailings. 
so those three were kind of my three legs that helped me start to grow my business. And then I did grow a sphere of influence over time. Um, but those were my three, like uh, definitely my three pillars. And, you know, as you started to see uh, the success come in, um, you said you, you eventually expanded this into multiple offices around Oregon. Uh, what, you know, kind of walk me through, you know, going from, you know, starting out and starting to get the success to then wanting to uh, bring on people and, and expand out. Well, as a, I had one of the unique, unique experience. I had one of the first teams in Oregon and maybe one of the first teams in the nation, honestly, is me and another guy. Uh, we were successful. We, I actually sold him a couple houses. He was from California, Scott, my buddy. And we said, let's partner up. And back then it was super uncommon for agents. It was all solo agents. Very, very rare. Some occasionally you'd have an agent that had an assistant. But, you know, I was like, what do you mean your partners? That's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Are you guys romantically? <laughs> no, that's not where we're at. It's just that we're partnering up. We're creating a team. And so we had literally one of the first teams um, in the country. It's definitely in the state. And from there, we we quickly realized that our team, we we're a very successful team. Uh, certainly within our office, we were number one and one of the number one in our entire franchises. But if we had broke our office, our little team out of our office, we would suddenly be the second the most productive office in the, in the county. So we're like, well, let's just break off and go open our own office. That was, um, you know, in retrospect, that was not the right thinking because owning an office and running a team are completely different. The most profitable, um, you know, people in most markets are team leaders who are running a team because they don't have all the expenses of an office. But that being said, <laughs> you got to make mistakes as you do it, right? So we opened an office. It was me, my buddy, and our assistant, and this is our office, right? Um, and then we figured out, hey, we got to start recruiting because we're going to have to, you know, somehow make this successful. And you know, your 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 mind shift shifts from focusing on production to focusing on recruiting, so your production naturally falls. And so this is what people don't realize about opening an office is that you're you have a shifted focus then, and your shifted focus takes you away from production. So you just got to understand this is a whole different business model now. It's not the same business model you had before. So that's, you know, that was a couple of the challenges and our experience coming in as we had to have that shift in focus that our customers are now uh, agents and not necessarily buyers and sellers, you know, so that was our, that was a, the first step in our success. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, this kind of goes into more of the, uh, the coaching and, and, you know, talking to other agents, you know, about, you know, launching their own teams or their own businesses. But I have to imagine um, that, you know, if you want to, for somebody that's wanting to make this jump and really branching out, uh, you have to make sure that you're able to sustain that period of time when you're yes. not out producing. Yeah. yeah, that I would say you need to plan for two years of reduced production while you're ramping up your other side of your business, which is recruiting agents into your team in your office. And that's just the reality of it, right? And, but, you know, a successful office can do extremely well. And if you are committed to growing an office, you can do extremely well. And it doesn't mean you have to exit production, but production will be impacted. There's just no doubt about it. Um, so what we did, and I'm a slow learner, but for the first five years, um, we said, well, the best way to grow an office is recruiting new agents. And so that was our kind of our thought. Well, let's just recruit a bunch of new agents. We were new agents once and we became successful. Um, so I, we would rent a conference room every month and every month we'd have this conference room and we'd advertise it in the newspaper and we'd bring people in that were thinking about getting the license or would consider getting the license. And we do a two hour seminar, get them fired up, get them motivated about getting their license. And maybe four or five of them would say, yeah, I want to get my license. And eventually we might hire two of them. But what we found and we grew, we definitely grew. But what we found is that and we realized is that 80, there's an 87 percent attrition rate in our industry. So most people don't make it, right? So no matter how good a mentor or coach you are, no matter how good your tech is, your brand is, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because it has to be this person's motivation and their drive and their energy towards the business. So what we figured out is that, you know, after two years, eight out of 10 of these people aren't going to make it. The two that do make it, and I'm being generous with the two, uh, one of them will inevitably say, well, because I started with your company, I got to go see if the grass is greener somewhere else. So they go to they go to another office. Now you're down to one agent out of ten that you put all this time and effort and energy into, and of course that doesn't work. You're going to go broke recruiting new agents. So what we said is, hey, we got to pivot, 
and let's go after experienced agents. And so by going after experienced agents, then you're targeting agents that have been in the business more than two years. And our model was more than two years, two to $10 million in production. And if you can bring them in and help them go from 2 million to 4 million or from 4 million to 8 million, now they're going to be massively loyal to you and they're going to become your best recruiters. And they're going to be singing the praises and they're going to be saying, hey, this is the greatest place you should be. And that just helps you grow exponentially. Then that's where we went from one office to 17 offices through that model of recruiting experienced agents and having that be our sole focus. How did your messaging change when you started recruiting the experienced agents? Because it, it's, it has to be a different, uh, you know, pitch and, and you know, uh, message that you're sending out there to these experienced agents. Hey, I know you're doing pretty well. Come with us. We can we can double this versus the brand new agent. Hey, we're going to get you, you know, your start in this industry. That's a great question. And there's a big misconception about recruiting and how recruiting should be done. So, and we've all experienced bad recruiters. <laughs> so, and I specialize in, in helping brokerage. This is my, I do brokerage coaching and my, my focus is recruiting experienced agents. But, um, so when you're recruiting new agents, it's easy because they're excited about getting into the business. They don't know anything from anything. They're just excited to come to work for anybody. So you can close and, and you can get them in your office really easily. So it's not like an issue. The problem is that a, a, a recruiter that's inexperienced will treat the, recruiting an experienced agent the same as recruiting a new agent and they'll come in and try to close an experienced agent to come to work. That will not work. In fact, you'll turn that agent off so fast they'll run the other way. So what you have to do is you have to treat uh, recruiting experienced agents the same way as if you're an NFL team coach, you're an NBA coach or owner of a company and that you have to create relationships with these players. You've got to, um, uh, create constant communication with these players and you got to open the door. So if I was recruiting you, Michael, I just, I would come to you and say, Michael, I'd love to have you on our team. Obviously that's a massive decision, but can I tell you why I, I'm, I'm saying that I want you on my team? The reason why is because I've seen you in the market and the way you conduct yourself, your professionalism, your social media, how you're involved with the board. I'm just impressed by it. And you're just exactly the kind of agent we'd love to have on our team. If there's ever an opportunity to have a conversation, just so you know your options, I'd love an opportunity to have a conversation with you. So now I've opened the door, right? right. And part of the first step is I've got to dis, I've got to create a um, a group of people I'm targeting. So maybe that's two or three or four or five hundred agents in your market. I've got to open the door with all of them with a conversation similar to that. And then I've got to start stacking benefits and stacking value. Now that happens in a lot of different ways. Could be conversations, could be meetings, could be text messages, could be video text, could be educational events you're doing but you're stacking benefits about your company. And here's the thing, we all, if you look in your market, we all see agents that you didn't expect to move, but made a move last year, right? And you're like, why didn't they come to work for me? They didn't even talk to me. What, what, what was, what's wrong with me? <laughs> why did this person come have a conversation? The reason they didn't come have a conversation with you is because you didn't open the door and you didn't stack benefits. If you'd opened the door and stack benefits, then they might've called you and said, hey, Jim, you know, we're unhappy because everybody's happy until they're not. So when you're calling people, they'll be like, oh, I'm never leaving. And then next week, they're, they moved over to XYZ coming like, what the hell? I thought you were leaving. Well, they, they were leaving until they got pissed about something that happened in their office. Technology failure, got mad at their broker, got mad at their, you know, some other agent in the office. Something happened, right? And so you just have to be ready for them when they're ready to make the decision. So that's kind of the, the, the you know, I'd say the strategy of it all. Right. So as you were uh, building this within within your own company, uh, and like you said, you know, really the goal is to get those those people that, you know, become really loyal to you and then, you know, really start, um, you know, are, you know, are kind of your pitch men for you. They're the yeah. people that are out on the street, you know, boots on the ground, you know, rubbing shoulders with fellow agents. Say, hey, you should really come you know, check out what we've got going on here. What, how did that change your business when, you know, you really started getting a lot of people out in the field recommending you? Yeah. So there's, there's kind of a bright line with offices and that is you definitely want to get to a place where you are attracting agents. In other words, you're getting three or four or five agents a, a month calling you and saying, Jim, I want to interview. I want to sit down with you and tell me, I want you to pitch me on your company. That's the, that's like the sweet spot. That's where I want to be. I want people calling me and that's going to come from having these agents out on the field. Like you're saying, uh, singing your praises, giving you great testimonials and reviews and really endorsing you. They're what I would call raving fans. Right. But in the beginning, you're not going to be there in the beginning. When you're starting from, from ground zero, you're going to chase, you're chasing agents. 
right? So there's a, that, that bright line is I'm chasing, chasing, chasing. And then eventually I'm going to come over the top of the hill. I'm going to start attracting, right? So that's the goal. And in the beginning, the chasing is I'm having to do exactly what we train our agents to do with their sphere of influence. We train our agents to with their sphere of influence. You got to have a contact matrix. Got to be touching your database 20 to 50 times a year. You got to be setting meetings and you got to be making appointments and everything else. And then hopefully over time, we build a referral base that's big enough that people are like, oh, Jim's great. You should work with him as an agent. And you start to become referral based. And the goal for all agents is to have your business be 90% referral based. It's exactly the same for recruiting. It's just you got to have your change in your mindset with, as a broker. Yeah. So, you know, going from, uh, for you personally, you know, going from, you know, launching these businesses and having, you know, the 17 around um, and then, you know, eventually getting into uh, coaching with NAR, what made you decide to do that at that time? And what was it about the the coaching and teaching that really drew you in? Um, for me, it was, I, I like to experience different things and, and challenge myself in different ways. And, and sometimes when I, I, I'm great at building, I'm not so excited about managing what I've built, right? So <laughs> I'm a great, uh, you know, entrepreneurial spirit. I love the growth. I love the fast growth. I love the hard work and I love the nitty gritty, the sausage making. But then once I've got it built and successful, I always get bored really quickly. So for me, whenever I built a company, I like, okay, I'm ready to move on and do something else. So that's just my personality type. I don't know what kind of personality that is, but that's me. And so for me, um, I when I built this company and we got to 17 offices, I just was looking for a new challenge. And my challenge was, can I be, a, can I have impact as a coach and as a teacher, as an author? And I, I was fortunately able to do that. And then I got thirsty for it again. I came back and did it again. So I, I needed to prove to myself that I could do it twice, which I did. Right. And then in that time, how uh, did you did you find any changes in the the agents that you're recruiting, or just the way uh, maybe uh, because teams have become you know more popular now, and, and just the model of the industry? Did it change at all in the time that you from the time you sold to the, coming yes. back? Yeah, definitely technology definitely you know enhanced and um, gotten big in the industry. Marketing and branding has also become massive in the industry. So companies that are winning on the recruiting side have great marketing departments and great branding. That wasn't so much the case in the early days. Um, now you're, you have to have a great marketing department, great social media presence, great online presence. So that's a big part of it. Also, uh, I think another thing that's changed is uh, offices have gotten really, I think, uh, the successful offices anyway, have gotten really smart on the fact that culture is a big reason why people stay at companies. So building a culture I think millennial generation, the Gen Z generation, they demand a culture that is uh, fun, that's engaging, that is something that they enjoy coming to work every day. They want positivity. Whereas before it was all just about work. Now they want, hey, I want a fun culture to come to work for. So I think culture has become a bigger a player in it. And in terms of teams, absolutely teams have become much more dominant in the industry. There's a danger to teams. Uh, and being somebody that was a team leader, I can I can identify with this, but you can't fill your whole office with teams because there's teams for an office have very low profitability because you can bring a team in, they cap out at whatever, and then they continue to do another 50 or $100 million. And you're, every dollar that's going through your office costs you money. So you, you have costs associated with all those transactions. So you got to be careful that you're not too heavy on teams. It's like a, a two-stroke engine and your company's running on a two-stroke engine, you want to have the right mixture of teams. So the mixture of teams versus solo agents versus agents with assistance has got to be just right. And that balance is part of what we coach to as well in our system. Right. And I, I want to get into uh, your coaching program. Uh, sure. when, did you, when did you launch that? And tell us a little bit about it. So I launched that. It's been about six years ago um, that I launched the coaching uh, platform. And the, uh, the coaching that I do with brokerage owners um, is that we get together twice a month. So we get together on the first Thursday and third Thursday of the month. And we meet in a mastermind kind of session, 30 to 40 brokers from across the country. We're agnostic on brand. So we've got all kinds of brands from every type of um, you know companies out there and franchises out there, but a lot of independents too. So I'd say half of them are independent companies. And what we do during these sessions is we're doing a uh, guided coaching for an hour. It's very accountability based. So at the beginning, everybody says, what'd you get done last two weeks? And then at the end of it, we say, what do you want to get done in the next two weeks? 
And then in between those two sessions, the uh, broker owners have full access to me to ask me questions and dive into, um, you know, deep topics or objections are getting out there in the field. So, um, and then on top of that, we layer on something else. All the agents at these individual companies also get access to my agent level coaching as well. Because here's the number one thing that will attract agents to a firm or push agents out the door. The number one thing is per agent productivity numbers. So when I can come to you and say, Michael, our company has a per agent productivity number average of, of 15. In other words, our average agent is closing 15 deals a year. I just happened to notice this morning running some numbers that the company you're at has an average per agent productivity number of three. <laughs> so we're doing 5x the productivity. I'd love to show you why that's happening and how I think we can help you grow your numbers as well. I know you're more than 15, but I know we can help you grow your number. And if you're interested in having that conversation, I'd love to have it with you. So your Parisian productivity number is massive and we give everybody a tool to grow that number as well within our coaching. Right. For, you know, when, when somebody, um, you know, is joining your coaching, what, uh, how do you get started with them? What are the kind of conversations that you're having uh, with these people that are, are that are looking to to build their, their organization? Well, we do a discovery call, um, and that discovery call process is me um, interviewing them, and they're interviewing me. And in that interview process, you know, we're finding out how big they are, what their goals are, um, what kind of marketing and tools that they have, what kind of staff do they have now. And we want to make sure they're the right fit. Sometimes when it's a brand new um, uh, office that's starting. Uh, they need a lot more help. And so I'll say, hey, let's do a couple individual one-on-one -on -one meetings before we get you ramped up into the group coaching. So we kind of try to tailor it to the individual needs of each of the brokerage owners that are out there. Uh, I love working with startups. I love working with small companies that are really starting to grow. And I think that's fun. But I also work with companies that have three or 400 agents. So uh, it's kind of a mix. And, uh, you know, I was reading, um, you know, several of the things, uh, you know, on your, on your website and, you know, and the, the sheet that was uh, provided to us. And I really, and I'd love to kind of dive into a few of these um, topics here. Sure. And, and one of those, you know, really um, being just, um, you know, some of the, the key considerations uh, that you should have when staffing a, your, your brokerage, what are those things that you should be looking for uh, in the people? Uh, like you said, you know, you mentioned it earlier, the, the different, um, you don't want to staff it, everything with teams, you want to have a good yeah. mixture of those solo agents. Well, you want a deep bench, right? So you need some new agents. When I say don't recruit new agents, you still gonna have new agents coming to you. And it's not that I never hire a new agent. That's not the case, but we're highly selective in who we hire. Uh, so we vet them really hard, but you want to have a, a group, you know, you want to have people in every quartile. There's going to be some people that are million dollar producers, two million, four million, five million, eight million. It's not going to be all top producers. And you want to be, have that whole nice bench, just like an NFL coach, just like an NBA coach. You got your starters, you got your rookies, you got the middle of the bench, you got your defensive players, you got niche players. So from that perspective, on the actual staff that supports the agents, um, you know, that's going to look different for different offices. When you're starting out and you're brand new, you're probably going to have one staff member. But then eventually that staff member is going to be an admin that's going to be doing everything in, you know, kind of a jack of all trades. But then as you grow, you're probably going to add a person that's going to be doing escrow coordination or sometimes known as the TC or transaction coordination. Uh, you might have a listing coordinator. That's going to be the person in charge of doing the data entry on all the listings that are coming into the listing under the office. Uh, in my office, you might have multiples of that. You might have two escrow people and two listing coordinators. Um, of course, you're going to have your front desk staff. You might have an accountant or a, a bookkeeper in the back room. Um, and then you, you probably at some point, if you're wanting to run a, a bigger company, is you're going to have another broker. Uh, that's going to be doing a lot of the broker uh, transactional management, answering questions. Just a couple of suggestions I have when you're when you're hiring staff members is that to remember you don't want reflections of you, and so the the natural tendency is to hire people that are reflections of you. The problem with most team leaders that they're alphas at, or most office leaders are alphas. And if you hire another alpha, you're going to butt heads, right? And they're they're very most of us that are at the top of uh, running a company are not very detail orientated. So the worst thing you can hire is somebody that's just like you that's not very detail oriented. You want the exact opposite. So I'm going to go across the board. I'm going to hire somebody that's more of a, um, a very analytical type of person. I'm a high D. You want the high A. So it's a very analytical that will dig into the numbers. And and you it may when you're having a conversation with them, it may feel a little awkward. You're like this is an awkward, but that's what you want. 
that awkwardness is meaning that they're probably something that's really data driven that will dig in and do the things you don't want to do. So you got to hire for different roles. That front desk person, you still want to have somebody that's somebody warm and somebody friendly, somebody that's family oriented. So you got to say, what's the role I'm hiring for? What personality type fits best in that role? So the other thing I would say in terms of hiring staffing really quickly is that when you hire a staff member, one question I always ask my staff members, as I say, what do you think we do here at this company? And inevitably, when you're in an interview situation, it'll be like, well, you sell real estate. And I'll say it would look like for that from the outside. Right. But that's actually not true. Well, actually, what we do is we our customers are the agents. We serve agents that sell real estate. The agents sell real estate. Our job is to serve these agents at a high level. Are the agents are our customers. So the way we work with these people is that they are the customer. They're not always right. But we try to really help them and elevate our service level to them. And that mindset shift, you can see it like little like clicks into place like, oh, <laughs> I didn't think about it that way. Right. <laughs> so it's just an interesting conversation. Right. And, you know, you talked about it, talk, you know, and touched on it several times. Uh, but, you know, the uh, the agent retention and, yes. you know, building up that culture. And what are some of the things that, um, you know, owners can do to make sure that they are retaining their rock star agents and, and building them up to uh, not only succeed, but want to continue pushing themselves? It's a great question. So the, the number one thing to think about when you're retaining agents is that um, friends don't leave friends. So the reason why agents leave you is because the relationship that they have with you as a broker is probably deteriorated to some degree, not intentionally. But what happens is, is that brokers, the squeaky wheels get the oil, right? So the squeaky wheels in your organization are generally brand new agents or agents that are not productive, agents that are complaining or whining about something. Your top producers are in the field selling real estate. You don't see a lot of them, right? They're out there crushing it. But because you don't see a lot of them, the relationship can kind of fade to black. And that's a danger, right? So you have to intentionally create relationships that are deep with these top agents. So... There's a lot of things you can do with that. You need to be intentionally calling them. You need to intentionally take them to lunch. You need to intentionally write them handwritten notes. You need to treat them just like your sphere of influence and really touch them. The number one thing I do with all agents is um, to get them more productive in general. Like my my top agents are my top agents, but the, the mid bench, the low bench uh, folks is what I'm seeing you in the hall is I'm going to have some small talk conversation. How's your family? How's it going with your kids? Whatever. And I'm going to say, now let's talk about your pipeline. How's your pipeline right now? And we're going to get to a pipeline conversation. And you're going to say, well, I said, how many people in your buyer pipeline? How many people in your seller pipeline? How many escrows you got going? They'll be like, I got one deal. I got this on there. It sounds like you need some help in coaching. You got 20 minutes. Let's, let's sit down and really dial into the, what you're doing in terms of work. And when they know that there's somebody watching their performance, somebody that cares about their performance, they're going to, there's something called the Hawthorne effect, which means that when you're watched, you perform at a higher level. So if they know you're watching, they will start to perform at a higher level and they will love it. They crave this level of leadership. That's what all agents really want from us is leadership in, in terms of productivity. The weak brokers, what they do is they're afraid to have a, a, a productivity conversation because they're afraid the agent will leave them. That's the wrong attitude. You got to say, I'm going to help you with productivity. I'm going to help you grow your business. So, so two things I would say is create deeper relationships with every agent, friendships. Uh, they need to look at you as being their friend. And second, help them with productivity, coach them through productivity. Yeah. What's been, you know, when you have had those conversations uh, with agents, uh, what's, you know, what's been that, you know, immediate reaction when they kind of see that, you know, you're there, like you are paying attention to what they're doing, but you are also invested in their success. You are, you are willing to kind of roll up your sleeves and sit down across the table with them and go through their particular pipeline. And then what's that uh, reaction after the fact when things start to turn around for them? Well, I think the, a lot of agents go into, uh, th th there's always a level of desperation with some agents. And when they feel like, oh my gosh, I'm coming to the end, I can't buy my rent or I'm, I'm can't make, make my car payment. And they know that you care and you'll sit down and spend time with them. The most valuable gift you can give anybody is your time. And when they know you're investing your time, they're going to really appreciate it. But here's the key. When you give them the time, you got to say, let's, let's not just talk about this. Let's create a game plan. So let's write down five things you're going to do in the next, you know, three or four days. And I want you to commit to doing these things. So you two together with them create this list of five things you're going to do. I call your five non-negotiables. Uh, here's the five things you're going to do for the next five days. But the key thing is when they walk out of your office, you got to go back, back into your CRM 
you got to make a flag and say, I'm going to touch base with them in five days from now. I'm going to say, John, I'm just wanted to touch base with you. How to go with the, with our, with our plan of the last five days, because they will do these things for the first couple of days and then they'll fade out. But if they know, then they come back and five days later and you, you call them on it. They'll be like, Oh, well, <laughs> and then the next time you have a meeting that you're serious about it, that you truly care and that you are committed to their success. That's what will inspire people to really take them, take it to the next level. They will also have a big group of agents that do take it to the next level and they have a quick success. And you'll get those texts, you'll get those emails like, Jim, I did it and it worked. I've had so many of those texts over the years. That's what I call a euphoric moment. When you have that euphoric moment, leverage it. And then you can say, hey, you know what? The best thing you can do for me, since you had that win, give me a testimonial on social. Give the company a testimonial on our Google business page. You know, endorse us. And the other thing on the, on the flip side of that is you should be endorsing your agents as well. On, on all socials, on all their Yelp pages, on their Google business page, take some time and endorse all your agents. They'll love it. Right, absolutely. And I think it's really interesting, you know, uh, you know, talking about how what you do with uh, with your coaching and having the the accountability meetings and things like that. That's that's exactly what you know in the same in the same sense of it that you're you're training these brokers to do with their agents. Have these right. have these meaningful conversations, but hold them accountable to the different steps that are along in the process. Exactly. Yeah, they want it because people forget. You know, we all came from other jobs. None of us generally start in real estate. And when we had the other job, we had a boss that stood over us and they told us what to do in exchange for the paycheck. And if we didn't do it, we'd be fired. Right. And so when people get into the business, they suddenly have all this freedom. But most people don't know what to do with it. And they have the, they generally have the freedom to go broke, which is what most of them do. So what they really crave is somebody coming in behind them and saying, now, John, you need to do this. Jane, you need to do this. They want it. They really, really want it. A lot of times we're just afraid to deliver because we're afraid they're going to leave us. But you got to remove that fear and give them that leadership that they really crave. Right. And I think that goes back to, you know, what you started out talking about was that your your mind shift has to change from, you know, with leading a brokerage is that you're no longer attracting the home buyer and seller. Your your main job is the agent and that's your your main focus. Yeah, you live and die by that per agent productivity number. That's your true measurement of how effective you are as a recruiter, as a re somebody that's retaining agents, that's got great, great marketing department, that's got great um, technology, that's got great branding. Everything you do, great staffing, every single thing you do as a, as a brokerage owner leader stacks up into your per agent productivity number. So that's what you live and die by. And that's what you're driving all the time to get that number higher. Yeah. One of the things I did want to ask you about, um, obviously, because, you know, we are in such an age of technology and there's so much coming out all the time. Uh, what are your uh, your essential technologies that every modern real estate brokerage uh, needs to be implementing? So there's like what I call um, positions of parity and then positions of difference. Right. Parity would be I have to have these things just to get on to just to have a conversation with somebody joining my company. Like. I have to have a mobile responsive website for every agent, right? That's like a given. I have to have that. I've got to have um, the ability to give everybody in my company a, an email address that's that's unique to the company. I shouldn't have everybody using a Yahoo or Gmail or AOL, God forbid, or something like that. Everybody should have the access to a, a, an email address. I should have a CRM program, right, of some kind. I should have uh, a, a, a CMA program, so CRM and CMA. I should have an automated valuation platform. And, and, and that's maybe a part of my CMA system, but it's there, right? So those are like some basic things that would be like parity level things that most big offices or big box stores have. Now, as an independent office, you might say, Jim, that's a lot. But here's the thing. What happens with independent offices, and this is what I coach to a lot, is we start building a company and we try to make it so inexpensive for the agent that we think that it's all about commissions. It's not. That's the biggest mistake and the biggest fallacy in recruiting is that I just got to be the lowest cost person out there. If that were true, everybody worked for the lowest cost office. And that's just not true. Your top agents generally don't work for the lowest cost office. Why do they agree to pay the extra dollars? The reason why they agree to pay the extra dollars is because they want services in exchange. They want the technology. They want the systems. They want the branding, the marketing the services. So here's what I would recommend all offices, even small offices do is Figure out a tech stack that you could deliver. Start interviewing technology companies and then figure out a cost to that tech stack that you're going to charge agents. 
And that could be a nominal fee. It could be 50 bucks a month. It could be $75 a month. That way it's not eating into your profit, but you're giving them access to the tools that they need to be successful in the marketplace. Almost every large successful office today has some level of tech stack fee. It's just necessary in order for you to compete at a high level. So those are the things I'd be thinking about. And then to, for, for positions of difference, like how you're going to be different in the market, uh, what I'm coaching to right now is creating an AI tech stack. So an AI tech stack is now going to totally differentiate you from, from the, the vast majority of offices out there. And that's where you're going to bring other systems to play. There's a ton of other AI systems you could you know, add into the office that would make your office completely unique and different. Right. Absolutely. Uh, just before we wrap up, you know, uh, tell me about, you know, some of the, maybe a particular success story or, you know, a, uh, a broker out there that, you know, was maybe struggling to, to get their, his business, his or her business, you know, going in the right direction and, uh, what, you know, some of the success they've had after, you know, speaking with you and, and getting this kind of accountability that you're, you're giving. Yeah, we've had a ton of successes out there. I mean, just two that come to mind really quickly. My, my friends out in, uh, SoCal, um, Lifetime Realty, Tommy and, and Jamie Kim and, uh, their, their manager out there, Cole Harvey, they've done an cr- incredible job building that company. And we partnered with them, uh, I think it's been three years, four years ago. Um, the first year they were with us, they had a 300% increase in their productivity of their agents and they're able to build to recruit. They're continuing to recruit. They're continuing to build out an incredible, uh, company. Uh, my buddy Antonio out, uh, cousin out in, uh, Louisiana, um, a New Orleans area out the greater New Orleans area. Um, he is, uh, went from being an eight, I was coaching him as an agent and he was a very successful agent, went from a million dollars to $10 million in production, then opened his own company and, uh, service first real estate. Um, and now he's grown that. I think he's got, I think he's at 28 agents and growing, uh, done very, very well in a very short period of time. So he's just kind of crushing it creating a very, very uh, unique company out there just doing very, very well. So, um, but again, we, we work with all kinds of offices out there that um, uh, that are just out there doing very well. And the, and the focus, it, again, is just, it's recruiting and retention and culture building and helping agents be more productive. Yeah, absolutely. For anybody that is listening to this and wants to, uh, to learn more about, about what you're doing and, you know, more about your coaching, where can they find that? So if they go to, they can find me all over social media at e, like elephant, erealestatecoach.com or erealestatecoach, that's my handle. But if they go to the website, erealestatecoach.com, um, we've got a ton of information about our brokerage coaching, but we also have something for free for your audience is a, um, a webinar called Rockstar Recruiting. It's two hours of some of the best ideas, scripts, text, emails, strategies, and techniques from top recruiters from across the country. So they can plug in that for free, just get a little taste of what kind of the coaching that we deliver. And then if they like what they heard, or they like what they saw, they can sign up for that brokerage coaching discovery call as well. Awesome. Well, I really do appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak with us today. And I think, you know, just the topic of recruiting and retention is one that um, if you, if you know, you're getting into launching your own brokerage for the first time, it is a, it, it kind of blows your mind a little bit. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you again so much. Thank you. I want to thank Jim for joining us today. And I think it's really interesting how he uses the same tactics agents use to engage with their spheres to recruit and retain agents within a brokerage. Remember, you can check out his coaching at erealestatecoach.com. So once again, if you think you or someone else on your team has an incredible story or real estate tips to share with our community, send us a message to feedback at smartagents.com. Well, that wraps things up for this episode, but remember, follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to the Smart Agents YouTube channel. Again, I'm Michael Walter, and we'll see you on the next episode.